So, uh, in short, what Lakatos says is the job of the philosopher of science is to act as a spin doctor of history. That's not a terribly flattering phrase. Let me try to sort of unpack that. The, the test for a philosophy a philosopher of science uh, is to see how well they can make the history of science look rational. Um, Lakatos is basically just assuming that the major turning points in the history of science are rational. Uh, so, example here, uh, at a certain point in the history of science, it was the rational thing to do to reject geocentrism in favor of heliocentrism. Uh, this is not something that he sort of has a sort of a, sort of around a, a, a the bend argument for something that he feels he can sort of spell out in detail. It's just sort of obvious to him that at, that at a certain point in history, this becomes rational. Now, the test of a particular philosophy of science is to see how well it accounts for these major turning points in the history of science. Um, so the more rational the history of science looks from the point of view of a particular philosophy of science, the better that philosophy of science is. Um, now, ultimately, it doesn't matter too much whether or not the philosophy of science actually sort of uh, fits the, the literal history of science all that well. Um, obviously, it has to fit it at least in general. But again, you want to remember that that all theories have anomalies. That's going to be true for scientific theories, as it's true for 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 uh, for philosophies of science in general. Um, there's there's going to be a certain amount of fudging to make the history of science fit with your philosophy of science. And and Lakatos thinks that in general that's okay. Uh, we can sort of call this if, if if he's against instant rationality, this is retrospective rationality. This is seeing the history of science through a particular lens, through a Popperian lens or a positivist lens, for example, or if you will, a Kuhnian lens. Now I do want to be clear: he's not advocating intellectual dishonesty. He's not saying that we should change the history books in some sort of Orwellian fashion to fit the dominant philosophy of science. Uh, he he says that we actually do need to make sure that any time that we are fudging the history of science, anytime that we are sort of uh, bending things to fit this narrative a little bit, we need to be honest about that fact. We need to quite literally in the footnotes, he says, he says you know, in the footnotes of our history of science, we have, to, we have to spell out, technically speaking, this didn't quite happen like this. This is an oversimplification. We're, we're ignoring these other sorts of factors that were going on. And so we do want to tell the full history of science, um, but it, it's impossible to tell a full, complete history of science in a way that's coherent. Uh, and so, and and, and we, 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 while we value the complete story, we also need to value a coherent thread that will make sense of it. Anyone who's ever tried to write a textbook understands what this is like, right? You, you have to somehow create threads that tie together a bunch of different aspects of your subject matter in a way that, that your reader is going to be able to comprehend. If you try to cover every single base, it's going to be not only ridiculously long, but ridiculously convoluted. So we uh, have to be allowed a certain amount of fudging of the history. Um, obviously, the more fudging we do, the worse off we are. Uh, but no, hist no ph history and philosophy of science is going to be able to capture everything completely. Now, let's take an example of this by looking at how Karl Popper looks at the history of science. Uh, if, 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 if we're going to go along with Lakatos on this one, if, the, if, if a, the test for a philosophical history of science is going to be fundamentally used as a heuristic device, that is, again, a way of sort of understanding the history of science rather than a sort of a straightforward, uh, 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 accurate, empirical account of the history of science, then that means that the test of any particular historical philosophy of science is fundamentally not going to be about sort of discovering the, the, the actual history of how things played out, but rather it's going to be about taking the major turning points in the history of science and making sense of them and explaining why it was rational for the scientific community to abandon this program and embrace another program. So, yeah, let's, let's take Popper, right? If, if we look at the history of science from Popperian lens, how rational were a lot of these turning points? Turns out they're not very rational at all, actually. Um, there's going to be many periods in, in science where Popper's going to say that people should have abandoned a theory, or if we're using Kuhnian language, a paradigm, or Lakatosian language, a research program, they should have abandoned their thing because it was falsified. Uh, clinging on to these things after falsification looks like straightforward, straightforwardly irrational from a Popperian point of view. But Lakatos thinks that historically speaking, 
this shows Popper is in the wrong, not that these uh, scientists were in the wrong. Uh, in the long run, holding on to theories that were, you know, technically speaking, falsified is very often the right thing to do. So Popper's philosophy of science isn't a very good philosophy of science from Lakatos's point of view, not because falsificationism is some sort of uh, fundamentally uh, 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 wrong way of doing it, but simply because it can't account for the history of science in the way that Lakatos thinks a philosophy of science needs to account for the history of science. It needs to explain why the history of science is fundamentally rational as opposed to, again, again the Kuhnian view, which views it as again, sort of a communal judgment. Again, reason has to be at the center of, of scientific progress for Lakatos. Now, again, I hope you can sort of tell by the language I've been using up to here that there is a kind of symmetry, a kind of parallelism between science and the philosophy of science. If we're, if we're going to evaluate a scientific theory based on how it deals with anomalies, we can do the exact same thing with a philosophy of science. Uh, you know, and, and if you have a philosophy of science like the positivist uh, uh, philosophy of science, uh, it, it, the way we test the positivist philosophy of science is by going back and looking at other cases in the history of science that the positivists didn't look at. You know, so so again, uh, most of the major turning points might already sort of be uh, uh, aware in people's minds. So we might have to look at sort of maybe some 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 less famous ideas. But again, thankfully, there's a lot of history of science out there to explore. Um, so so the sort of future cases, in this sense, it's not, it doesn't literally mean in the future. It means unexamined cases, cases from the past, but the cases that we haven't explicitly thought about when we're building our philosophy of science. Um, uh, if a sort of unexamined case in the history of science uh, uh, is dealt with well by the philosophy of science, that's a way of sort of suggesting that it can handle these sorts of anomalies well. So again, the, the data, quote unquote, for a philosophy of science is the actual historical cases. And in the same way that there is no sort of theory, no paradigm, no research program that can accommodate all the data perfectly, there's, there's not going to be any philosophy of science which is going to match the entire history of science perfectly either. Every single theory is going to face anomalies, and we have to just sort of accept that fact. Um, uh, what's interesting is not whether or not they face anomalies, but how they deal with those anomalies. So again, the most important thing for a philosophy of science, as the most important thing for a research program, isn't really getting the facts right. That matters. He's not suggesting that we can completely ignore the facts, of course. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is how it deals with new cases. Uh, what it allows philosophers of science to do, in the same way the most important thing for a research program, is how it deals with these new anomalies. Does it give scientists tools for a asking new questions and developing the program in interesting ways. So this exact same language of progressive versus degenerating research programs doesn't just apply to theories and research programs within science. It applies to philosophies of science as well. Lakatos's theory here is very reflexive. It, he tries to live up to his own standards. He's suggesting this is how we evaluate uh, scientific research programs, and this is also how we evaluate philosophies of science. Now, I want to close this discussion here by, by throwing in a comment from uh, another philosopher of science, Larry Loudon, who was another post-Kuhnian thinker who, who was also responding to, to ideas from Lakatos. Uh, Loudon, in many ways, sort of refines Lakatos's thinking and, and in some ways improves on it, uh, but I don't want to sort of delve too much into the, the, the details of Loudon's thinking. But I do want to highlight one important observation that Loudon has, which I think fits really well here, um, and it's, it's, it's worth mentioning here in closing. Uh, and that is the, the difference between accepting a theory and pursuing a theory. Uh, these are two different psychological attitudes that a scientist can have towards the theory that they're working on. Uh, Loudon thinks it's kind of naive and, and, and a false description of scientific practice to say that there's really only one attitude that scientists have towards their theories. Either they believe it or they don't believe it. Um, uh, either they think it's right or they don't think it's right. Um, that, for, for Loudon, not only fails to, to describe the actual psychological relationship that scientists have towards the theories that they work on, it actually would, uh, again, if, if that were correct, it would paralyze scientific progress in various ways. Scientists don't have to believe in their theories in order to investigate, test, and experiment on them. Indeed, 
most of these sort of major scientific changes in history started with people who accepted the dominant paradigm, to use that Kuhnian language, for a long time, but nonetheless they decided to explore a new paradigm for a while just because they were curious. It wasn't that they fully rejected these the, the sort of the dominant paradigm, they just thought, huh, I wonder what happens if we sort of think about this a different way. So that kind of freedom to think creatively uh, uh, for Loudon is, a, is an important way of distinguishing between this, this notion of accepting a theory versus pursuing it. They might pursue it because it's useful. But, you know, they, don't, they don't think it's true, but it might sort of develop new technologies or new tools that might sort of help us in other areas. It might just be exciting. You know, here's something that's never been tried before. Here's an aspect of our scientific theory, a way of looking at our scientific uh, uh, theories or our, our, our scientific data that hasn't been done before. Yeah, it's probably wrong. I don't think it's going to pan out in the long run, but you know what? It's worth experimenting on anyway. It's worth giving it a shot because who knows? Maybe it'll pan out. Maybe it actually will be right. But even if it doesn't pan out, we might learn something by exploring it this way. So that it's always rational, Loudon thinks, to pursue a promising theory because that theory, again, might have kind of potential for solving puzzles. It might, it might give us uh, advancements in ways that we didn't expect. But we want a higher bar, he says, for accepting theories. Accepting theories, that's the kind of thing that we only do after it's got a very long track record of solving puzzles. After it's been able to make sense of a lot of data, it's survived lots of anomalies, lots of uh, uh, different kinds of experiments in different fields. Accepting a theory is something that we only do uh, uh, after again, sort of the, the sort of the, the judgment of history has been weighed on the theory, but pursuing a theory, it's a different attitude, psychological, short-term view may turn ultimately into accepting a theory. Probably won't. Most of the time, it doesn't. Uh, but by distinguishing this, the, these two different attitudes, pursuing versus accepting, uh, we can we have a more accurate picture of the psychological relationships that scientists engage in when they are pursuing their theories.